The video presentation that you're going to see in a moment shows where dentistry and healthcare is moving forward. What started out as an attempt to fight malodor, but removing the bacteria on the posterior third of the tongue, has morphed into a complete concept of what I call oral decontamination. The first thing you're going to see is a short video talking about improved brushing and flossing. We will get into more techniques for debriding the mouth. We're going to talk about the role that chronic inflammation can have and the role that actual oral decontamination can have in perhaps preventing pneumonia, the impact that modifying the diet and using foods that are anti-inflammatants can have on perhaps preventing the uh, developing of neuroinflammatory diseases such as uh, Parkinson's, MS, and uh, Alzheimer's. So this is a complete overview on this. So enjoy this and think about what we as healthcare professionals can now do to prevent some of these uh, inflammatory diseases. Let me give you some tips on more effective toothbrushing. First of all, when you brush your teeth, you don't open your mouth real wide because when you do, your cheek comes down and you cannot get up on those molar areas. The teeth should almost be touching. I'm going to use a dry toothbrush with this and you will notice how little toothpaste I'm going to use. Toothbrush companies or toothpaste companies would like for to use this amount of toothpaste and all this does is create a lot of suds and you turn a hole right in there and you really cannot efficiently brush. So this is all you need. And I prefer a gel to a toothpaste because I think this is less abrasive to the teeth over a lifetime. What we want to do, we only need a dollop of this about the size of a green pea. And everybody in the family should have their own toothpaste. You'll notice that I have no excessive saliva in my mouth. And you will notice that I'm going to use about 25 strokes here, 25 strokes here, 25 on the inside, the same thing in the lower. So proper brushing, and you only need to do this once a day if you incorporate uh, oral decontamination in your program. So let's brush the upper teeth. That's 25. And notice the teeth are almost together so I can get behind the molar back here. And when you're brushing, I would actually count like that. Think about what you're doing. But you should be able to actually talk while you're brushing if you do it right. Now let's go to the other side and do 25 strokes. And notice that I'm using a soft brush, which you can get in any drugstore. I'm using it dry. And what I'm doing is a circular motion right at where the junction of the tooth is to the gum. But what I want you to notice, the amount of saliva that I have created with the brushing technique. Now let's go to the lower teeth and repeat exactly the same thing. 25 strokes, 25 strokes, 25 strokes on the inside. And notice I can actually talk. And then on the inside. And notice I'm using a vertical stroke. My elbow is in the air. And now brushing is complete. And as I rub my tongue on the teeth, they're just as slick as they can be. Yes, you can use a mechanical or electrical toothbrush if you so desire, but if you don't mind using just a hand toothbrush with just a rotary motion 
at the gum line, you can do a very nice job with a hand toothbrush. For years, I've watched students try to teach patients how to brush their teeth. And the first thing they did or do is to get a model and demonstrate on the model. And then they hand a mirror to the patient and let them try to duplicate that in the mouth. Personally, I don't think that works. I think what you need to do is type, take your iPhone, iPad, or something, and go ahead and re-record the video that I just showed you, you demonstrating it to the patient. Let them get a feel for what they're doing, and then hand them the toothbrush with the amount of toothpaste, and let them visualize what they're doing, rather than trying to hold a mirror up and do that. And I think you'll find it's going to work one hell of a lot better. Now that we've talked about brushing, let's talk about flossing. And we'll give you some hints that will make you uh, a better flosser. It'll enable patients to do a better job because what I'm going to show you is simpler. But first of all, there are five reasons that the patients give for not flossing. Number one, my fingers are too big to get in my mouth. Number two, my teeth are too close together. Number three, it makes my gums bleed. Number four, it hurts. Number five, the floss shreds when I go between the teeth. Let's deal with the first one, and that is I can't get my fingers in the mouth. First of all, you need to have a piece of floss that's about 15 to 18 inches long, and you need to wind it down to where the working space between the teeth is only about this distance. Notice how close my fingers are together. But here's what patients do. They don't wind down enough, and they can't get their fingers in the mouth. So that's the way you solve that problem. Number two, my teeth are too close together. Now I have a healthy mouth, so therefore I can pop the contact and it doesn't bother me. But if you have an unhealthy mouth, what you want to do is angle the floss toward the palatal and floss through the contact to, from the buckle to the palatal. Watch how I do this. So that's the way you deal with my teeth are too close together. It makes my gums bleed and it hurts. Until your mouth is healthy, that is going to happen. So therefore, don't pop the contact in an unhealthy mouth. Work the floss gently through. The final thing is uh, that the floss shreds. Basically, that tells in that particular contact you've got a rough and restoration and probably it's going to be necessary to replace the restoration in that particular area. Now let's go and show you exactly how I floss in my mouth. All right, notice how close my fingers are together. I'm going to go between the last teeth, last two teeth, and here is what is very important and you need to get this across to patients. With the finger that's on the palate that is dead weight, you only floss with the outside finger. Now watch how I do this. Notice how I do that. Always the finger on the palatal surface or the lingual surface on the lower is dead weight. So therefore, if you will do that and follow the things that I've told you, you'll become a more effective flosser and you'll be much better at teaching this. Now a final little pearl. What I would suggest that you do, yes, you have seen me doing and demonstrating this on my video. I would suggest that you take the protocol that I have shown you, make yourself your own tape and put it on your own device, be it an iPad or iPhone, where you can show that to the patient. And once you get into practice, you as a dentist can show the patient how to do that without physically being in the room. The hygienist could use it in her room and it would be very, very efficient. So don't hesitate to make your own tape and not necessarily ideally follow this protocol, but certainly I've given you some suggestions to think about. We've talked about brushing and flossing and basically what we've talked about is the patient with a full complement of teeth. But what about the patient that has a partial denture and has isolated teeth around? 
Let me show you an effective way of doing that. What you see I have here are gauze pads. They're four by four, which means they're four inches by four inches. This particular one is three inches by three inches. And then they have the two by two. So what you want to do is open one of these packets. And ultimately, I would like to see the patient use the, uh, the sodium hypochlorite rinse that we're going to talk about in a minute uh, to dip this sponge in. And let's say that you have got a, a, a lower cuspid down here and a lower cuspid over here. So what you want to do, if you try to br brush that one tooth, it's very inefficient. So what I would suggest that you do is to take this two by two gauze and think of this canine down here as being a pencil and you're going to sharpen it. And you could put toothpaste on this or tooth gel, or you can put the solution but just come over the top of it and twist it around that, getting it down on the gum line. And ladies and gentlemen, that is much more efficient than trying to brush the tooth. Now, if you have two teeth that are close together, let's say a canine and a premolar, then you can take this gauze and open it up like this, twist it over, and let's say that these are the two teeth, wrap it around like that and just shine it like that. And if the teeth are uh, two teeth together, certainly you could use the floss. And you were talking about the sodium hypochlorite solution. And let's talk about disinfecting a partial or disinfecting a, uh, a denture. The brushing and flossing technique that I had taught you earlier should take about three minutes. So if you have a denture, go ahead and just rinse it out as you would, uh, brush it if you want to but then place it in that solution of sodium hypochlorite, one teaspoon to a quart of water, and let it soak for only three minutes. For God's sakes, don't put a denture in straight Clorox because it'll make it just as brittle as it can be. The same thing is true of a partial. So they only stay in there about three minutes, and as we'll see when we talk about oral disinfecting, you can actually disinfect the denture. So let me summarize that. If you have a single tooth, use a gauze square, either with toothpaste on it or preferably with sodium hypochlorite, one teaspoon to a quart, and use it like you were sharpening a pencil, being sure you get down on the gum line. Or on the upper, do the same thing. If you have two teeth together, what you may want to do is open this up, twist it around, and then wrap it around the two teeth and then shine with your fingers like this. And finally, soaking your ditcher or your partial in the sodium hypochlorite for, for uh, about three minutes is all that's necessary. P.S. These gauze pads that I'm talking about can be bought at any pharmacy. You can get four by four, which means they're four inches square, or a three by three, which is three inches square, or as I prefer, two inches by two inches because when you double them over on themselves they wrap better. This is an example of the gauze that we got from our local pharmacy. Please do not put it in undiluted Clorox for it will destroy your denture. For years we have talked about oral hygiene and plaque control but I want to offer a new concept to you and that is oral decontamination and certainly this is very important when it comes to the tongue. So the title of this video is The Importance of Disinfecting the Tongue. In 1972, McNamara and his colleagues reported that the major cause of bad breath are the bacteria found on the posterior part of the tongue. These are volatile sulfur compounds, VSC. And these are gram-negative bacteria and anaerobic gram-positive bacteria. And this research was done by Lopez and his associates in 2014. Prior to that, in 1998 and 2003, Gordon Christensen published two articles in the American Dental Association talking about the importance of removing these organisms on the posterior part of the tongue. And here are the two references. Now, Lopez also found that 90% of malodor 
is caused by uh, intraoral causes, but only 10% is, of malodor is caused by extraoral. These are the conditions that contribute to malodor. I'm not going to take the time to read those, but you can look and see which ones are extraoral and which ones are intraoral. Here is a key point. After brushing and flossing, 90% of the bacteria in the mouth are found on the posterior third of the tongue. And the only way to remove these bacteria is to vigorously scrape the posterior part of the tongue. And Lopez also found that scraping the tongue was ineffective unless it was part of a daily oral hygiene or disinfecting regimen. The instrument that I like best for scraping the tongue is called the tongue sweeper, which was developed by Dr. Robert Rippich, whose picture you see here. You can order this online, and the model that I like is the Pro model, and this is the original model that is on the right. And you can see underneath, if you order this online, a single one is $17, or you can order a pack of 12 for $77 if you want to send these to uh, other family members or friends. If you have family members that you live with, then you can order these color coded as you see here for the same price. Here you see the contact information on Dr. Rippich and he would prefer obviously that you order these online. And before we go any further, I would like to say that I have absolutely no financial interest in the tongue sweeper. I do not own stock in the company or anything like that. Now let's talk a little bit about typical mouthwashes. The classic one is chlorhexidine, which kills bacteria by disrupting the cell membrane. And that needs to stay in contact for a significant period of time to be effective. But one of the drawbacks to chlorhexidine, it puts a black brown stain on teeth. Next are the essential oils, which are found in Listerine and other mouthwashes. Third is hydrogen peroxide, but this is only effective about anaerobic bacteria. But the least expensive, most effective mouthwash is a solution of sodium hypochlorite, which is found in household bleach such as Clorox. It not only kills bacteria and viruses and fungi such as yeast infection, but it kills on contact. But before you make a conclusion about using this, you need to look at the video on the most effective, least expensive bacterial bactericidal mouthwash, which is sodium hypochlorite. And this is used in a very diluted solution, one teaspoon to a quart of water. So go to this website and look that out, look this up before you draw conclusions. But there are other benefits to cleaning the tongue or disinfecting the tongue as we've talked about. And here's an article, The Association Between Oral Health Status, Respiratory Pathogen, Pathogen Colonization with Pneumonia Risk in an Institutionalized Population. And this is a recent study that was just published in 2018. This was a study done in a long-term care facility and the patient population was composed of 60 individuals. At the initial exam, scrapings were taken from the tongue and 48.3% of the 60 patients demonstrated these bacteria which are associated with a lung infection and pneumonia. So we had a high percentage of the patients that had significant bacteria. Now, during the study period, which lasted one year, 17 of the 60 patients, or 28%, developed pneumonia. And here's what they did at the onset of the development of pneumonia. Again, they took scrapings from the tongue, and they also examined the sputum. And the patient population of bacteria on the tongue perfectly matched those in the sputum. So this was significant in my opinion that by scraping and cleaning the tongue, we may reduce the risk 
of an elderly population at, you, at least developing pneumonia, which adds a totally new component and reason for not only scraping, but disinfecting the tongue. Let's do some speculation. The first speculation is disinfecting the tongue may have a positive impact on reducing the risk of developing pneumonia. Speculation number two, disinfecting the tongue may prevent oral cancer by killing the human uh, papilloma uh, virus or HPV. Why do we not want to use a toothbrush for cleaning the tongue? Because a lot of people say, I clean my tongue with a toothbrush. But first of all, if you use this, it's a wet toothbrush and the only place they clean is the anterior part of the tongue, but that doesn't get to where the problem is. The problem is on the posterior third of the tongue. And if you try to put the toothbrush back there, it gags you. And with a wet toothbrush, with those bacteria on the posterior part of the tongue, what do you do? You just smear them around. So let's do it right and let's use the tongue scraper that is advocated and the one I used by Dr. Rippich. Now remember, Dr. Rippich was a mechanical engineer before he went to dental school. He made several trial prototypes on this before he got the one that angles the best, gets back there and gets the job done. Now watch what I do. I can put this tongue scraper all the way back there and that does not gag me. So you don't want to sweep the tongue, you want to actually scrape it. And watch what I'm going to do. Now ordinarily you do this in the bathroom, but I want to get up close, so I have this container here that I'm emptying in. And I can tell you, just from that little amount of tongue scraping that I did, my mouth feels immediately 100% better. The taste is better, the smell is better, the sense of well-being, everything is better. So I urge you to practice all four components of oral disinfection. Brushing, interdental cleansing, and using the tongue scraper to get to the posterior third of the tongue after you have rinsed with the sodium hypochlorite, which is the least expensive, most effective bacterial bactericidal mouthwash that we have. Now let me show you how to mix exactly one teaspoon of sodium hypochlorite to a quart of water. First of all, you will notice here that I've got a tablespoon and a teaspoon. Look at the difference in the size. You do not want to use a tablespoon, you want to use a teaspoon. Now, look what happens. I've got an empty bottle here, and then I've got the teaspoon here. So look what happens if I try to pour this in there and get the exact amount. Notice I've got too much in there. Here's the way you avoid doing that. You want to pour the sodium hypochlorite in a uh, measuring cup like this. Now look and see what I do. I tip this on the side. I take my teaspoon. I put it in here. And therefore, I lift up and place exactly one teaspoon in there. Now, I don't want to discard the rest of this, but because this has this little uh, uh, deal on here, I can take this and pour this back into the bottle and I have conserved my sodium hypochlorite. I have got exactly the right amount in here. Now, let's go to a link and show you how powerful this is. In 2009, the CDC released a paper showing how to decontaminate contaminated water and make it drinkable. Now, if the water is clear, you only use one eighth of a teaspoon. However, if the water is cloudy, you use a fourth of a teaspoon. So that just shows you how powerful this is and how you can use that for drinking. But in this particular case, we're not going to drink the water. We're just going to use it to decontaminate the soft tissues of the mouth 
after we have done classic brushing and flossing. At the end of this presentation, there will be a disclaimer on uh, what can happen if you drink sufficient amounts of this uh, diluted sodium hypochlorite. But the disclaimer is, this information is being provided for educational purposes only and the solution should only be used at your own risk. Second, this is not a prescription and as I said earlier, the solution should be used at your own risk. Under no circumstance should it be swallowed. Children not, do, should not use this solution because they may inadvertently swallow it and obviously expectant mothers or women considering becoming pregnant should not use it. Let's talk about the side effects of ingesting sodium hypochlorite. Drinking bleach can cause effects that range from mild to severe, depending on the amount that's ingested. Medline Plus states that consuming diluted bleach or sodium hypochlorite may lead to mild stomach irritation. Ingesting larger amounts can lead to a gagging sensation, pain in the mouth, and actually burning in the throat or the esophagus. You may have chest pains, low blood pressure, slowing heart rate, delirium, coma, shock, vomiting, and stomach or abdominal pain, and probably if you drank enough, it could cause death.